Our next lecturer is Dr. Jeffrey Herbener. Dr. Herbener is a professor of economics at Grove City College, and his lecture this morning is on subjective value and market prices. Yep. All right, thank you. Um, let's begin at the beginning uh, of uh, economic theory. We uh, define human action as purposeful behavior. By this we mean that it's directed toward the attainment of an end, or we might say that um, uh, attaining the end is the motive that a person has for acting. <clears throat> but we know that uh, possessing an end, desiring to attain some particular goal, is not sufficient for action. In order to act, uh, we must also identify and then possess means by which uh, our action can be uh, accomplished. So we could say that human action we would define as applying means to attain ends. So it's an ends means framework. <clears throat> now we begin economic uh, theory with the fundamental axiom of economics that human action exists or sometimes we say individuals act. Uh, this is uh, axiomatic because any attempt to show that humans don't act is, of course, an action that has the end of disproving the axiom <clears throat> and uh, uses means. Uh, the person would design an action and use means to try to show that uh, human beings don't strive to attain their ends. So uh, we're on pretty firm logical ground, uh, beginning with this uh, fundamental notion of human action as purposeful behavior. Now, once we've established that, uh, we begin uh, the process of reasoning uh, in economic theory by uh, just reflecting on the meaning of human action. We just think about what it means to engage in human action. And because we're human beings, we can do this successfully. Right? We can uh, discover all sorts of things about human action uh, just by thinking about uh, action itself. Uh, we've already seen that uh, we can discover that human action has ends and means. There's a distinction between the two, right? We, we, they're not the same thing, conceptually, or in action. <clears throat> uh, we recognize uh, other uh, fundamental things, like the difference between uh, success and failure in action. We, do, we just understand this because we are human beings who have acted in the past, and this is uh, a part of our experience. Uh, and what we want to talk about uh, this morning in this lecture is uh, one of these fundamental reflective concepts, which we call valuation. <clears throat> uh, and then we want to see, after going through the logic of uh, valuation, we want to see the uh, connection between valuation, which is, as we'll see, the process by which uh, in individuals uh, decide on different courses of action, uh, when they're considering only their own personal action. And then uh, what we call, or what Mises calls, appraisement, <clears throat> which is decisions about the different courses of action in society that is constituted by a division of labor. So these are two different realms of action, right? And we'll see that valuation uh, uh, is inadequate to make decisions about uh, allocating resources or uh, designing different production systems or uh, deciding on particular ends to pursue in the division of labor. So that's where we're headed in this uh, lecture. So let's start with the um, basic principles about valuation. And the first thing uh, that uh, we arrive at here, just so we're clear about the problem that we have to solve uh, theoretically when we think about these issues, <clears throat> is this proposition that only individuals act. So in economic reasoning, we can't uh, presuppose or introduce uh, by assumption a collective acting entity. If we want to do economic theory, we have to build the theory up from individuals who are engaged in action as human beings. <clears throat> uh, this uh, creates all sorts of uh, theoretical uh, difficulties for us, right? All sorts of uh, puzzles. Uh, in our explanation of how society works. Uh, but the one that we want to uh, focus on is how is it possible in a division of labor society for the different valuations that different individuals make to be reconciled? 
you know, it's easy to see how Robbins Garuso can arrange his uh, actions and uh, be efficient and uh, get what he wants uh, given his situation in isolation. It's not so easy to see how all of us with all of our different valuations about different things that we wish to attain and different means that we possess and so on and so forth <clears throat> are able to harmonize all of our different uh, actions in a way that uh, we all have our ends satisfied. <clears throat> okay, now the second uh, uh, point that we want to make is a, a fundamental point that we recognize again just by thinking about action is of course that means are scarce or we might say the point in a different way that human beings are finite. We're not able just by an act of will to accomplish our ends. It requires the application of means. And uh, if it requires the application of means to attain our ends, then means are scarce to us. In other words, we have unmet ends. And if we have unmet ends, this can only be uh, the case because our means are not uh, super abundant. If they were super abundant, we already have satisfied all of our ends but we haven't done this. This is what action is designed to do. So there can be no such thing, uh, despite the uh, uh, claims of uh, you know, politicians and uh, others, uh, some economists even, uh, there can be no such thing as a post-scarcity world, right? Uh, the principle of scarcity is built into the nature of, <clears throat> of human existence and can't be avoided. Now, it's certainly true that there are different degrees of scarcity and how we uh, judge in our actions, the different degrees of scarcity of things is one of the problems that economic theory is designed to, uh, to uh, solve. <clears throat> now, from the scarcity of means, we can see that human action requires us to uh, allocate means. So when we act, if human action exists, it means that we are acting, right? When we act, we must be able to say, uh, through a judgment of our mind, uh, I will pursue this course of action and not that one. I'll, I'll take these means and apply them to this particular end uh, to the exclusion of applying them to some uh, other end. If we weren't able to allocate our means, of course, uh, we would not be able to act at all. So since we can act, uh, we see that uh, means are allocated. Now when we choose to pursue one course of action, uh, this choice is two-dimensional. So we choose uh, the course of action that we uh, wish to pursue and and relative to that, we set aside the course of action, the alternative course of action that we uh, are not pursuing, that we're, we forego in action. So action is always predicated upon a choice. <clears throat> so the next step is to say, well, okay, what's, what criterion of choice do we make as human beings um, when we're faced with this problem of allocating our means? And the answer to this we've already seen, we do this by our purposes. Or again, to use another uh, name for this, we do this, do this by valuing the different options in front of us. So we say this course of action is more valuable, that course of action is less valuable because the first course of action satisfies my purposes more fully and the, and the second one uh, less fully. <clears throat> now this is the idea, this, um, this uh, comparison of the value of different options in acting is uh, the concept we call in economics preference. So we're using this concept just in the dictionary sense. We prefer one thing to another. We prefer one course of action to another. We prefer one set of means to attain an end to another. Uh, we prefer doing uh, an action at this moment in time as opposed to that uh, alternative moment in time, uh, and so on and so forth. So preference we can see just in this uh, quick uh, overview of the logic of, of these basic concepts is what we uh, call an ordinal rank of options. We're just saying one thing is ranked above another. One thing is preferred, another is uh, a preferred less. <clears throat> uh, moreover, preference is not to be confused with um, musings about action. Preference is not what we think about action. Preference is the valuing that we've done by which we choose on a course of action. It's not the plan that we have to act, it's, and it's not what we are, are mentally thinking about with respect to action. It's the judgment of our minds that we make when we say, I'm going to do this. I choose to do this and not that. So preference, notice, is always bound up with action itself. 
because preference is the criterion of choice. And choice is what is, is, what is impelling us, so to speak, to uh, act in one direction uh, versus another. Uh, this is why Murray Rothbard calls preference, uh, he uses this helpful term, he calls it uh, demonstrated preference. That when we act, we reveal our preference in our action. So our preference is not what we say about our action or think about it, it's what we choose. Right? That's where our preferences uh, manifest. Now there are two important uh, principles about valuing that we want to uh, delineate. And then now we get to the subjectivity. The first is the subjectivity of value. So what do economists mean when we uh, use this adjective? <clears throat> what are we referring to when we talk about the subjectivity of value? Well, here we're just uh, talking about the, um, you know, the fundamental uh, distinction between a human subject and an object. The human subject is one thing, right? And then there are objects that exist outside of the human subject, or to say it differently, subjective things exist only in our minds. Objective things exist outside of our minds. This is what we mean by subjective. So we're saying, if I value a chocolate ice cream cone, the value that I place upon it exists only in my mind. That's its subjectivity. Now notice certain things are implied by subjectivity. The most important is that for our purposes in economic reasoning at least. The most important uh, is that you cannot measure things that are subjective. In order to define a unit by which you could measure something, uh, the unit itself has to be objective. It has to be commonly understood by different people who would use it as a measuring device. And so objective things can be measured. We measure the mass of a rock, or we can measure the distance from Auburn to uh, Atlanta or whatever. Uh, but subjective things are not subject to measurement because we cannot define a unit of measure. In fact, it, it, this is a nonsense uh, a claim, right? Uh, subjective value is not something that can be measured because it has no substance to be measured. It has no objective presence to be measured. <clears throat> uh, this means, of course, uh, well, this has a couple of implications. Uh, one is that... Um, we cannot uh, ascribe cardinality to utility or to value. We can't just assign numbers to, uh, to uh, value and uh, perform arithmetic operations with these numbers. That again would just be a, uh, you know, a pastime. It would be a, it's a game or something, but it wouldn't have any meaning with respect to human action. The second thing is we, uh, we can't interpersonally compare our values, because we have no common standard in which to do this. If I were to say, I get 10 units of value from a chocolate ice cream cone, and you say, well, I get 12 units of value from a vanilla ice cream cone, that doesn't mean that you actually get more value than I do, because our units aren't objective. We're not, we, we don't know what the meaning of the units are, right? There are no units uh, to be compared here, so 12 isn't necessarily more than 10. This is just you know, sort of a game that uh, could be played, but it isn't meaningful uh, to do this. So that's one dimension of, sub, uh, of uh, value that we call subjectivity. Now another dimension that's completely separate from this, but also important in doing reasoning with respect to uh, utility and prices and these basic uh, principles of economic theory, is the constancy of value. So we understand just, again, by reflection that our values, uh, the things that we value, you know, I value a chocolate ice cream cone, I value a Honda Accord, I, I value, you value coming to the Mises uh, University and so on, that these values are not constant with respect to the external circumstances of our actions. The reason we know this, of course, is because we, it's meaningful for us to have uh, regrets about our actions. When we regret an action, in other words, the reason why this is meaningful to us is because we say, oh, I did this action given these external circumstances, but I, I could have chosen something else, but I didn't, and I wish I would have. I wish I wouldn't have gone on that blind date. I wish I wouldn't have you know, driven, driven my uh, car into a tree or whatever. Right? So, so because, because that's meaningful to say we have regret, we understand right away <clears throat> that um, 
that it's our mind, it's our mind that's judging these external circumstances. And then through the judgment of our mind of these external circumstances, we, we choose our action. And that the external circumstances don't somehow just force us to choose in some particular way. So therefore, we can't do, the, the uh, reason this is important is to say, as an implication, that we can't do functional analysis in economics, even if we have cardinal numbers. Because functions require that you write out equations that have variables and constants. But there are no constants, right, in human act. There, there's no... There's no constant by which we could apply uh, to a functional uh, understanding of human action. So this is why we don't have demand functions. So with demand functions, we don't have the problem of the lack of cardinal units, right? The prices have cardinal units, the quantities that we're buying have cardinal units, but we still can't do mathematical uh, economics because we can't formulate functions, and we can't formulate functions because there are no constants in human action. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> next, just uh, let's just follow up uh, on a few things from these basic ideas that you'll uh, come across in other lectures. It's kind of foundational to some things that are uh, discussed later. In fact, uh, even in the lecture uh, this afternoon on capital and interest. Uh, so if we continue along this line of subjectivity, we've said so far that value is subjective when I value the ice cream cone or I value the, the uh, um, uh, Honda Accord or whatever it is, it's also true and must uh, 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 simply be implied from what we spoke about before that cost is also fundamentally subjective in human action because cost is just the value of the alternative I did not choose. And so we see the, this idea of opportunity cost, right? That cost is not only associated with the individual person but it is also subjective, just as value is. This means also, one step further, that there is a meaningful notion of net benefit in action. We might call this profit. Uh, Rothbard calls this psychic profit. Right? It's the subjective profit of an action. So there's a difference between the value of what we strive to attain in the action and the value of the alternative we forego. And in fact, um, Every action, in, in every action, the person must anticipate that there is this profit. That's what, imp again, impels the person to choose the, the preferred uh, course of action. So profit is not a concept uh, you know, that is relevant only to the, uh, to the capitalist pigs in the, you know, in the uh, exploitive system of the market. It, it's a fundamental notion of human action. It's a value difference that we're trying to uh, attain when we uh, engage in action. <clears throat> uh, now, uh, one, one last uh, concept on this line that we want to uh, talk about is the principle of economizing. And you see this uh, as a prominent element of uh, Mises' thought. <clears throat> because this uh, principle of economizing uh, summarizes or encapsulates this discussion that we've had up to this point. And uh, we can... Uh, uh, think of economizing with respect either to the means or the ends. So if I have a given means to economize my means, I strive to attain the highest valued end I can with those means. I have $100 and I go to a mall someplace and I shop around and if I'm economizing, I buy the highest valued good or set of goods that, I, th that I'm anticipating or, or thinking about in my mind. Uh, with the hundred dollars. I've economized. <clears throat> uh, we also economize with respect to the ends. For a given end that we wish to attain, we use the means that have the least value. This would be economizing. Notice we're not saying that people uh, wish they economized. We're saying that by the logic of thinking through the structure of action, this is what we're actually doing. We're actually economizing. Or to put it more correctly, we're actually striving to economize. We're anticipating that this choice will give us a greater value either in the end that we attain or in the means that we use. That is to say, we'll economize our means. We use fewer valued means so that we have those means that we didn't expend on that line of action to expend on another. <clears throat> okay, now the next principle 
uh, we, we move on now to the, to the more advanced, we want to move to the interface between these basic principles and the more advanced. <clears throat> and this is the idea uh, that um, is, uh, in Austrian economics, called imputed value. So we have, we, we've set up this, uh, so far, we've set up this, this sort of problem, right? We can see that uh, we talk about value just being in our minds, value subjective, but objects have value, don't they? We speak about them as if they do, right? We talk about the value, I talk about the value of my car, I talk about the value of my money, I talk about the value of my house. So objects have value too, and the question is where does this value come from? Does this value reside in the objects? Is it intrinsic to the object? Is it a property of the object, uh, like mass or color or some other dimension? <clears throat> uh, or does it come from the subject? Right? Is, it, is it our valuing minds that give value to the, to the object? Now, of course, you can see, of course, uh, the uh, Austrian view is the latter, right? Uh, the, uh, this idea of imputed value, that the value of objects is uh, imputed from the human mind to the object as a means to attain the end. The reason this is true uh, is that, as we've seen before, uh, that action is always in the ends means framework. The point of acting is to attain your end. The means are simply aids to the attainment of the end. <clears throat> and, and by the way, of course, if, uh, if we could attain our ends without the use of means, we would do so. If we could just will our ends to be attained, right, that would be better than having to do something to obtain, uh, obtain the end. <clears throat> okay, so we might think of the uh, options this way. So the Austrian view is this first one. Uh, we have value originating in the human mind, and then it's imputed to the consumer good. So I value, uh, <clears throat> I value a chocolate ice cream cone, <clears throat> and uh, in, ex in exchange, if I'm offered the possibility of exchanging, I can value it with respect to money, I can buy it, right? This, this imputing value would lead, lead to a demand, as we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> and um, once a price emerges for the consumer good, then the value of the consumer goods gets imputed backwards, so to speak, to the values of the producer goods that make the ice cream. So the ice cream cone you know, would have a certain price that would be based upon the price of the, uh, of the end product. So, so the uh, there's a company in Pennsylvania that actually makes these cones. Right? You know, the flake uh, ice cream cones. <clears throat> and so uh, the price of the cone is not independent, so to speak, of the price of the uh, ice cream cone the, the, uh, with the ice cream in it you know, being sold to the customer. This is the idea. We have to work, uh, so to speak, with value. Uh, uh, logically, we have to work backwards. Right? The, the value is imputed backwards. Uh, from the consumer good to the factors of production. <clears throat> now again, the reason for this is because, um, because value is, uh, is in the end that the consumer good achieves for us and not in the means by which the consumer good uh, is produced. <clears throat> now this, this raises one further puzzle for us. Well, how is it possible then for there to be prices of these you know, basic ice cream cones, the, the flake cones without any ice cream in them. How's it possible for there to be a price for that coexisting with the demand for the ice cream cones when they're filled with ice cream and sold to the customer? The, the price already exists, doesn't it, for the, for the uh, uh, factors of production, the labor, the wages that are already being paid. So how is that possible? They, they, they seem to coexist, right? They seem to be synchronous. <clears throat> and the answer to this is expectations. The answer to this logical problem is anticipation. So when we say that the mind is the source of the value that's being imputed backwards, what we're saying is it's the anticipation of the value that arises in the minds of people that leads the entrepreneurs to pay prices today to buy these factors of production in anticipation of selling the consumer good at a price that's determined by those demands and that, that will arise in the future uh, that justify those costs. So it's expectations that uh, solve this problem of the seeming incongruity between uh, 
between the time dimension of moving backwards in imputation and knowing that there are already producer good prices. We'll, we'll deal again with the, some of these questions uh, as I suggested in the uh, uh, afternoon lecture. <clears throat> now the second line would be uh, the theory of, uh, uh, you know, labor theory of value or cost of production theory of value, which says that the value of uh, producer goods is uh, inherent in the good it's intrinsic to the good. <clears throat> it isn't caused by anything else. It's pre-existing in the good. And then through production, uh, that value is transmitted to the consumer good. And then once the consumer good has a price, the ice cream cone sells for four bucks or whatever, then my mind assents to it. I say, oh yeah, I see, that uh, ice cream cone's worth four dollars. I agree. Right? That, that's how this theory would have to proceed. <clears throat> and you can see again that the basic flaw in this theory, is, I mean, uh, granted all the uh, nuances and technical arguments, but the basic flaw is it, it simply uh, inverts the ends means framework. It, it just, it's, uh, it's just a logical fallacy to think uh, uh, that since all action is aiming to attain an end, that the means can have independent value. That's just, right? that's just off the table so to speak, uh, in, this, in this theorizing. Now the last row it would, be, uh, would be the uh, uh, mutual determined uh, theory of uh, Alfred Marshall or the neoclassical theory of partial equilibrium theory, right? Where we have uh, the mind valuing the consumer good. This would be the demand side of the market. Right? It's based on utility and so on. And then we would have the cost side, which is based upon some notion of intrinsic value of the factors of production. And somehow these meet, and then uh, the price for the consumer good is the, uh, jointly determined by the uh, costs of the factors of production, which are independently determined in this, or, or seemingly independently determined in this theory, and are subjective values for the good. But again, you can see right away that setting aside all the nuances and technical aspects of this uh, claim, it, it too violates this basic fundamental principle that all action is in an ends means framework. If all action is in an ends means framework, that there cannot be any independent source of value for the means, right, for the producer goods. Their value must be derived from the value of the end that they attain. <coughs> okay, so now let's think about um, this, uh, the next step of this interface between valuing and what uh, Mises calls appraising. So we, we've spoken now about the valuing part of this. <clears throat> um, appraising is, uh, or appraisement, is the process by which we make economizing decisions in the division of labor. And the first point to see is, is simply that it isn't possible to use valuation to do this. If all we had to uh, refer to in making decisions about how to use factors of production uh, in an economizing way in the division of labor were our own personal valuations, we'd be unable to move forward. <clears throat> what we need in the division of labor, since in the division of labor each person is producing for the consumptive ends of other people, right? The ice cream entrepreneur is producing for my consumptive ends and yours if you're a demander of ice cream and not his own. He needs to be able to compare meaningfully the valuations that different people make in their minds for the end products. But we've seen this is something that he, uh, he cannot do, right? He cannot do directly, at least. And so we're presented with this problem. Notice uh, we might more formally put the argument this way. <clears throat> if we tried to envision how valuation might be used to make decisions about how to allocate resources in the division of labor, in order to get the highest valued goods produced, the highest ends uh, attained, we can see that the subjectivity of value presents to, uh, well, is uh, a problematic in, uh, for all the solutions that we might imagine. And the solutions would boil down at least to these two options. One option would be, let's just have an agent decide for us. Let's just appoint someone and have that person uh, make the decisions about what the most valued goods are in society. This is the, what you might call the political solution, right? 
we just elect represent, representatives. We, uh, we appoint a, uh, a king or you know, Solomon is uh, reigning over us or whatever. But you can see the problem here is that in order for the agent to meaningfully decide which valuations are the greatest, he himself would have to experience these valuations since they're subjective. But this is the one thing he cannot do, right? He can't, we can't interpersonally experience our own valuations. That's what subjectivity means. When I eat an ice cream cone, I get a certain you know, pleasure from it or whatever you might call it. And you cannot experience this pleasure. You can experience your own pleasure from eating the ice cream cone, but not mine, right? That's the problem. And so the agent is, in, in, in a sense, in a worse position than we would be ourselves in trying to solve this problem. So that's the second possible solution. Let's solve it ourselves. Have direct democracy. Let's just vote or something of the sort, right? But again, you can see the subjectivity of value means that if we do this, we'll, we'll come to a, a solution, right? We'll, we'll make a decision, but it won't be economizing. We'll just, we're just in the dark about what is economizing when we vote because we're not actually weighing subjective values against each other in the way that we do this in our minds for different options of our own action. Right? We're just voting. It's an entirely different process. Uh, the same problems uh, or the same difficulties with the solutions exist for uh, selecting means. If we think about how would we select production processes that minimize cost, that, right, use the least valued means, um, without appraisement, well, then we have these two options again, right? We just, let's have an agent do it. But the agent, again, in, in this case, is in a slightly different, uh, slightly different problem. For the agent to have experience, and therefore, for him, in his own mind, to be able to rank these different options across the division of labor, he doesn't have necessarily have to experience other people's uh, subjective values but he would have to perform every function in the division of labor, right? He would have to be a mason, a plumber, a, a truck driver, a brain surgeon, and so he could have personal experience with that activity so he could say, oh, I value that more than this. I don't really particularly like being a coal miner, right, relative to something else. <clears throat> well, that's the problem. <laughs> Who, who's able to do this in a division? We have a division of labor precisely because we no one person can do everything. This is, this is the advantage of it, uh, the division of labor. Uh, then the other solution, again, is just, well, democracy, right? We just vote on who's going to be the coal miner. We vote on who's going to be the brain surgeon. This, uh, again, is uh, uh, not effective in determining who the least cost coal miner would be. Because if, uh, frankly, if it's between you and me, and uh, I'm going to insist that my uh, opportunity cost is really, really high for being a coal miner, and I assume you would too. And there's right no objective way to decide between us. So no, no vote could ever ferret this out. It's a, a knowledge that simply uh, is beyond the human understanding. <clears throat> OK, so uh, the solution then of the market is schematically looks like this. <clears throat> So this is uh, this a slide gives us uh, pricing theory, sort of boiled down to the different conceptual steps, right? So the first step is we have preferences. So if, if the cause of all the prices and therefore all the production patterns in the market economy is our preferences. It all boils down to this. So we have certain circumstances that exist. There are certain external circumstances in the world. And then we form judgments of our minds with respect to these external circumstances. These are our preferences. So notice all of the objective external factors of the world influence prices, influence our actions and prices through the judgments of our minds. That's why we put preference at the, at the beginning of the logical sequence. <clears throat> okay, once we have preferences, then uh, some people will demand things. We can have preferences, in other words, for trading things. Uh, other people will supply. They'll have preferences that lead them to supply because their preferences differ from the demanders. And supply and demand will determine the prices of the consumer goods. This, by the way, is the step of the analysis that we want to cover in this lecture. You know, so we'll, we'll cover this part. <clears throat> but once we have prices of consumer goods, then the prices of the consumer goods will revenate, uh, or excuse me, generate revenue for the entrepreneurs. 
So if the ice cream cone sells for $4, it'll generate a certain, you know, has certain demand and a number of cones that can be sold for that price. It'll generate a certain revenue for the entrepreneurs who produce it and a cost for consumers, certain expense on my part to buy it. The revenue for the entrepreneurs then uh, leads to demand for the producer goods. So if the revenues are high enough for this line of production, the entrepreneur will have enough funding to uh, demand the factors of production and outbid on other entrepreneurs to acquire the factors of production. And the entrepreneur is aiming again at a value difference, right? He's aiming at monetary profit, trying to keep his monetary costs below his monetary revenues in this process. So this is where the demand for the producer goods comes from, demand for the labor, for the ice cream, for the cones, and so on and so forth. Preferences then in this long line here, right? Preferences uh, dictate the supply of the producer goods. So as, uh, as workers, we're establishing our preferences for different jobs and the money income or the monetary compensation that comes from these different jobs. And then the interplay between supply and demand in the, in the factor markets determines the prices of producer goods. So the wages are set by this process of imputing the uh, monetary value of the goods that are being produced by that labor through entrepreneurial demand uh, in, in the uh, factor markets. So we get the prices of producer goods. This generates costs for the entrepreneurs and income for the producers. <clears throat> and we can see then the first, uh, th this isn't a complete schematic, but we can see the first uh, step of uh, appraisement here, or sometimes uh, the format of appraisement is called economic calculation. We can see the form of decision making called economic calculation. In the uh, revenue that the entrepreneurs earn from selling the good uh, that they produce and the costs that exist for uh, hiring the factors of production or buying the factors of production necessary to produce the good. Uh, this would be um, the net income. Uh, the, the net income, or uh, you know, we could call this uh, gross profit, Mises calls this, <coughs> uh, from production. And entrepreneurs then can be agents of us in the division of labor, making their decisions by appraising the monetary profit of different lines of production. This is, this is the basic argument about how the market solves this problem of uh, the interface between our subjective valuations and some objective basis for making comparisons of these, uh, of these subjective valuations. That, that allows people to make uh, economizing production decisions. <clears throat> now, in our lecture on capital and interest, we'll take the next step that isn't on this uh, diagram, and we'll talk also about the other form, the other basic form of economic calculation, which is net worth or equity. So this is embedded in the uh, prices of producer goods, but uh, it's the capital value of the producer goods. So we'll, we won't mention that uh, again uh, at this point. Okay, so the next, next step then, we want to just deal with this, uh, this uh, connection between preferences and the prices of consumer goods. Let's just run through the uh, economic theory. <clears throat> and this begins with the uh, development of what we call uh, the laws of utility or the laws of subjective value. <clears throat> And these laws are derived from economizing and imputation. So we simply take these basic principles that we've spoken about and we apply them to the conditions of buying and selling things. And, and then we arrive at the, logically at these laws, <clears throat> these laws of utility. Now there is one uh, condition we might call it with respect to the development of these laws. And this condition is what uh, Rothbard calls equally serviceable units. So when we talk about the laws of utility, the laws of utility apply only to equally serviceable units of a good. Okay, so what do we mean by equally serviceable units of a good? First of all, the unit of a good is the amount of the good a person uh, chooses as appropriate for his action. So the unit of the good is a choice variable. So again, I would choose, let's say, to consume one ice cream cone. That would uh, satisfy my, uh, uh, my end of consuming ice cream. But let's just say it's like that. But it wouldn't have to be that way, right? I could choose a unit of three ice cream cones. 
I'm, I'm really uh, craving ice cream. Then in that situation of acting, the unit would be three ice cream cones. I'm choosing it, right? Or you, you, know, you might, uh, every example or every instance of action, there is this choice about the suitable amount of the, of the means that a person makes. How much water you use when you shower in the morning, uh, how much grape, you, grape juice you drink during the day, how many bananas you eat, and so on and so forth. So, so that's, again, not controversial, right? It's just this idea of a, a unit. An equally serviceable unit is a, are units that are interchangeably useful in different pursuits. So if I have an equally serviceable uh, set of units, I don't care which one of them I apply to the attainment of any one of the ends that I uh, want to attain. Just, just have an example, let's say I, uh, I have various uh, uses for water during the day, to drink and to water the plants at my house and to wash my hands and so on and so forth. And if, if I have equally serviceable units of water, it would be like having three gallon jugs of water sitting there in front of me. Uh, each one of them is the amount that, the gallon is the amount that I wish to apply to each of these uses during the day. And the equally serviceable part is that I don't care which one of them I use for any one end. They're interchangeably useful. If that condition holds, we have equally serviceable units. Now, obviously, equally serviceable units don't always hold in every action, right? We don't always have equally serviceable units. But when you think about market exchange, it's fairly apparent that equally serviceable units is a very common feature of market exchange. If I go to a, a grocery store and I'm uh, you know, going down the bread aisle and there's a loaf of Wonder Bread, there are actually 20 loaves of Wonder Bread not only equally serviceable, but physically identical. So if I want a loaf of Wonder Bread to make sandwiches during the week, or a loaf of Wonder Bread to feed to the ducks at the park, or whatever, uh, then I'm presented in the market with, in fact, equally serviceable units. I would find them interchangeably useful, right? It's not like one loaf of bread is consumable for humans, and another loaf of bread is consumable only for animals. I mean, it might be that way in the market, but, but typically we, we find equally serviceable units. Um, in cases where there's only one unit of the good, we can conjecture what would happen if there were an equally serviceable unit, right? So this is just a logical uh, implication. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's where we begin. And uh, let's take the case then uh, of how we derive demand and supply from preferences. So let's suppose, here's the particular case. Let's suppose that we have this potential trader over here is his preference rank, and this is a guy who uh, has some preference for a Honda Civic, but he will assume, just for the sake of the numbers, that he does not own one. So the first Honda Civic for the buyer would be the first one he acquires. The first one uh, is also then the most valuable one. Why? Because the first Honda Civic would be the one that he would apply to the most valuable end or set of ends that he can put, uh, put this means to. So if he has one Honda Civic, he would use it to commute to work and you know, do errands on the weekends and whatever uh, else uh, he might do with it. And he has a particular preference for the Honda Civic uh, relative to money that looks like this. So in this particular case, if he could find a trade uh, opportunity where, uh, let's say the price of this Honda Civic were $15,000, he'd be willing to make this trade, right? Because all action aims at a value difference. He would get something of greater value and surrender something of less value. So he's perfectly happy to do that. It's also true that he'd be uh, happy to, uh, to make this trade at any price below $15,000. <clears> at <throat> $16,000, though, he would not make this trade, right? His preferences are such that at $16,000, he takes another option. He would not buy the Honda Civic. He would just say, oh, price is too high. I like the car, but that, that's too much. I have better things to do with my $16,000 than that. Okay, so this is just preference applied to the instance of trade or to the, to the uh, possibility of trade. And then, and then all we have to notice, of course, is uh, conjecturally, what would be the case if uh, instead of just having one Honda Civic, 
he had an equally serviceable second Honda Civic. How would he value that second Honda Civic? And the answer is, according to economizing and imputation, the answer is he would have to value it less highly. Why? Because he's already attained his highest valued end with the first unit. That's why we call it the first unit, right? That's, that's the meaning that uh, uh, the first unit has. <clears throat> Uh, therefore, if he had another unit, he would have to apply it to a less valued end. He would have to lend it out to his friends or you know, whatever else he could think of doing with a second uh, 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 equally serviceable Honda Civic. He finds that use less valuable. Why? Because logically, he's already satisfied his most valued end. Right? So this is how the logic of the argument runs. Uh, with respect to uh, economizing an imputation. He imputes less value to the second unit. He would impute even less value to the third, and so on and so forth. Notice this uh, principle, this uh, first law of utility, that there's uh, diminishing marginal utility, as we call it. The larger the stock of a good, the less value a person places on the uh, marginal unit of it, <clears throat> uh, is a strictly logical um, uh, claim. It's not psychological. This has nothing to do with uh, saturation or satiation. You, you, you commonly see this, by the way, in uh, economic textbooks. So you have, because the textbook writer wants to appeal to college kids, he'll say something like this. You know, you have this guy, you have this frat guy, and he's at a party, and he drinks the first beer, he gets certain value, he drinks the second beer, ooh, that was even better, drinks the third, that was better yet. But when he drinks the fourth one, that's not quite as good, and the fifth one's not quite as good, but that's not what we're doing here. We're not talking about psychological uh, reactions to, to things. We're saying, in that particular case, let's suppose we have this guy, he goes to a frat party, and he says, well, I want to drink uh, you know, four beers. He picks a unit, in other words. And then he, he may change his mind, of course, once he starts drinking, but that's a different, it's a different question. But he says, okay, so uh, this is what I'm going to do. And then he satisfies his end by consuming that unit. And it might be six beers or 10 or whatever. That's the unit. And the question then is, what would he do if he had a second you know, unit of 10 beers? What would he do with that? Since he's, since he's fully satisfied his drinking end with the first 10, well, he'd have to do something less valuable, right? He'd have to give it to his friends or keep it for uh, tomorrow or whatever. So, so you see, see the difference of what's going on in this, in this derivation, what we're not saying uh, when we engage in this derivation. Now, the second law of utility just says that more of a good is preferred to less. The larger the stock of a good the, uh, is preferred to a smaller stock of a good. This is because a good is always valuable. Every unit of a good is valuable. So to have more units means we're satisfying more ends, which is always better, right? Always preferred. <clears throat> so these are the two laws of utility. And we see how these two laws of utility lead directly to the law of demand, right? So that only at lower prices will the buyer uh, choose to uh, purchase uh, additional units of the good. So as the, you know, as we contemplate hypothetical prices, if the price happened to be 16, he wouldn't buy any Honda Civics. If the price were 15, he'd buy this first one. If the price were 11, he'd still just buy the first one, right? Because he values uh, the first Civic above 11,000, but not the second one. Only if the price fell to 10,000 would he buy two. So only at lower prices, uh, will the quantity purchased of a good uh, be larger? So this is the law of demand, and it's uh, directly derived from these laws of utility. Uh, we can, and, and again, there's a nuance here that we want to make sure we're uh, capturing in the Austrian presentation of this, <clears throat> which is that this law of demand is a conjecture about what would have taken place under different circumstances of acting. It's not an empirical uh, claim. It doesn't say that this week, if the price of the Honda Civic happens to be 15,000, it'll buy one unit, but next week, if it's, you know, it's dropped to, I uh, have a big sale and it's dropped to 10,000, then he'll buy a second one. There are no laws of utility about what will happen over time in human action, because as we said before, over time our valuations are not constant. And so there's nothing, there's nothing stable, so to speak, in our choices that would allow us to have anything like a uh, systematic uh, claim about how we're choosing and acting. We, we could do all sorts of different things over time. So that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that 
Let's suppose that this guy goes into the market and he actually buys a Honda Civic when the price is $15,000. The law of demand says only at a lower price would he have purchased more, right? If the price would have been lower, he would have bought one Honda Civic or maybe two. But if the price were lower, he would not have purchased less, given that he did actually purchase a Honda Civic at 15,000. If the price were 16, he wouldn't say, oh, no, I'm not gonna buy. Because he's already expressed his preference to have a Honda Civic at 15. See? So it's just a conjecture about, we'll see why it, it's useful to have a conjecture uh, when we get to the end of this presentation. But it is just a conjecture. It's not, an, it, it's not the basis for entrepreneurs to make guesses about the future. The law of demand is not helpful in that respect. It's helpful only to the economist. <clears throat> okay, now from the same preference rank, we can deduce supply. We just have to change the conditions uh, under which this person's preferences are established. So let's suppose this guy, instead of not having a Honda Civic, let's suppose he had two. Let's suppose he starts here on his preference rank with possessing the first and the second Honda Civic. That, well, then he'd be in the position uh, that the market conditions were right to sell one of them or both. And so we can ascertain uh, how he would behave given, given those circumstances. So we see that at uh, $10,000, he, he would keep both of them, right? He has a value for even the lower valued Civic that's greater than 10,000. But if the price were to rise to 11, he would sell the second one. By second one, we mean he would sell the one that he's using for the less valued end. <clears throat> and then only at higher prices would he sell more, right? This is what the law of supply says. Given that this guy would sell one Honda Civic at 11, only at higher prices would he sell more. <clears throat> um, given that he's done this action, he sold the second unit at 11. <clears throat> so again, to think, to think to the contrary, to think that uh, the law of supply could be uh, the opposite, that at higher prices he could sell less, violates economizing and the principles of imputation. And so it's uh, sustained by these, by these notions. <clears throat> okay, now uh, the last uh, step of the argument then is to see about what we call the market clearing price to deduce it then from demand and supply. Now here it's helpful to introduce uh, competition into the market. We wouldn't necessarily have to do this, but it sort of completes the analysis to do so. We have more than one buyer, so the buyers can bid against each other, compete in that way. And we have more than one seller, so the sellers also can compete against each other in asking uh, better prices to try to attract uh, the sale from, uh, from the buyers. <clears throat> so notice we have buyer A, who's willing to uh, pay, this is our guy before, who's willing to pay $15,000 to obtain the first Civic. Uh, we follow Rothbard's convention here by putting what this guy doesn't have in parenthesis. So we're assuming he doesn't own a Civic. <clears throat> and then we have buyer B who's a little less eager to buy the Civic, right? Instead of being willing to pay 15, he's only willing to pay uh, $13,000 to uh, buy the Civic. And at 14, he would be bid out of the market. It's quite apparent that buyer A could bid buyer, me, uh, buyer B out of the market, right? He could outbid him. And buyer C is the least eager of these three buyers, only willing to pay uh, 11,000 to buy the Civic. He would be bid out of the market at 12. So here we're introducing an auxiliary uh, premise in economics that individuals differ. And again, nothing particularly controversial about this, but we have different preferences. And again, we learn this not through reflection, but just by experience that we have with other people. Uh, on the other side of the market, we have sellers. Since, since these civics are not in parenthesis, it means they, these sellers do uh, possess these civics. <clears throat> and let's say their preferences are such that we have the most eager seller. This guy's willing to sell his civic at 11,000. So this is our original guy again. We have a less eager seller, Y, who's, who's uh, only willing to sell at 13. So again, seller X could undercut seller Y. If there were only one buyer, right, it would go to seller X. <clears throat> and seller Z is the least eager of the three sellers. <clears throat> okay, so if we, uh, if we just want to analyze this market, uh, we can see the uh, demand and supply relationships here. 
And we see at $13,000, this market would clear. That is, the quantity demand and the quantity supplied would be the same, only at that price, right? In real markets, of course, there might be a range of prices in which quantity demand and quantity supplied are the same, but again, we'll set aside that nuance. The market clearing price is the price where, um, well, the market clears. <laughs> okay. Now, um, why is this? Why does this price uh, emerge, though? That's the, that's the question. Why why couldn't the price be uh, above this or below this? And the answer is that the only at the market clearing price are all the preferences of all the traders satisfied. All the three buyers get what they want given the circumstances of the market, and all the three sellers get what they want, given the circumstances of the market, only at the market clearing price. At any other price, uh, there's some trader, at least one trader in the market, who is not satisfied. And of course, the whole point of engaging in action is to, is to get what we prefer, right? And so naturally, the market clearing, everyone has, uh, everyone's uh, interests are in bringing about this state of affairs where all the preferences of the traders are satisfied, and that's why this happens, because it's being impelled again by the same motivation that any action is impelled by, which is we're all trying to obtain what we value more and give up what we value less. <clears throat> so at the market clearing price, uh, buyers uh, A and B will purchase the Civic. Buyer C will not purchase the Civic when the price is 13, and remember, he doesn't not want to, right? That price is way too high for him. In fact, he wouldn't even buy if the price were 12. Sellers X and seller Y sell Civics. Seller Z does not, and seller Z is perfectly happy not to sell at that price. Uh, he would, uh, uh, he, he's undercut at that price, right, and out of the market. So 13,000, he's only willing to sell at 15. So if the price is 13, he says, oh, I'm happy to keep my Civic, and that's what he does. Okay, so this is the basic logic of uh, the market to clearing. Now, let me mention uh, just a few last uh, comments about market clearing prices. Uh, sometimes uh, this, this process by which uh, the price that clears the market comes about is said in uh, non-Austrian treatments to be uh, brought about by trial and error, but that, that's not the case. It isn't trial and error. That's not the argument we're making. The argument is that the buyers and the sellers are able to anticipate where the market will clear. This is what makes a good entrepreneur, right? They can anticipate what, what the actual market price that clears the market will be. And therefore, they bring forth that supply that they intend to bring a, a, to market that does, in fact, clear, clear the market. Uh, the same happens with, uh, on the buyer's side. And again, we won't go into the nuances of these claims right now. That you'll take these up in later, uh, in later lectures. Now, let me mention just one last uh, point about this. <clears throat> this theory of the market clearing price explains actual prices in markets. The Austrian theory of price explains the actual existing prices for goods right now in all markets. It does not explain or attempt to explain hypothetical prices like the neoclassical uh, theories do. It doesn't explain long run equilibrium prices. This argument is explaining what the uh, price of gasoline is right now in Auburn, Alabama what the price of a loaf of Wonder Bread is right now in the you know, uh, Save-A-Lot grocery store in Grove City, and so on. Why are these prices the important ones to explain? Because these are the prices uh, upon which the entrepreneurs base their appraisement of um, uh, the value of things to be produced in the market. They don't base them on long-run equilibrium prices, right? They start with existing prices. This is what they know to begin with. What are the existing prices of the factors of production of the, of the uh, consumer goods? And then they anticipate what these prices will be in the future as they care, uh, you know, attempt to carry out their production plans. Okay, I've exhausted my time, so I'll stop uh, here. Thank you. <laughs>